Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to uh, be reading several verses here. Um, but before we actually get started with that, there's something else that uh, we're going to talk about. So while you're turning there, uh, just uh, listen uh, and, and we'll try to cover this <clears throat> very quickly. What I'm going to talk about uh, while you're turning there, if you haven't already found it, is uh, child dedication, what, uh, what that's all about. And uh, first of all, what I'm going to talk about today, and I, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this, not a lot of time, but uh, I'm going to talk about what it is not, what child dedication is not. Uh, because there is a lot of confusion. I, I've talked to some people about it and uh, what they think it, it, is, uh, it involves and what they think it relates to is not necessarily realistic or it's not necessarily biblical. Uh, but I, I'm going to say this. When we're talking about what child dedication is not, first of all, uh, child dedication is not taught in the New Testament. So what does that mean? Am I saying we shouldn't do that? That's a terrible thing that we're involved in now that we do that? No. That's not what I'm saying at all. Thank you. Uh, what I am saying is there's nothing in the New Testament that says you need to bring your children and dedicate them to the Lord. I will explain that more when we get to what child dedication is. Uh, but I do, uh, what, what, so what I'm saying is, is it a requirement? No. You have to bring every child and dedicate them to the Lord. Do you have to do that? No, it's not in the scripture. It doesn't teach that. Uh, however, uh, going on from that, child dedication is not a means of placing the child under the covenant. And this, uh, this is uh, a lot of things that are rolled up together, mis misconceptions about a lot of different things. Uh, some people think that uh, uh, when they baptize their infant babies, uh, that what they're doing is they're placing them under the covenant. Uh, that, that's what they believe and that's what they teach. Uh, however, uh, the Bible teaches us that the covenant is entered into by faith. It's not by baptism. It's not by child dedication. It's, it's by faith. Galatians 3.9 says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And they're always talking about, when they're talking about being placed under the covenant, they're always talking about being placed under the covenant with Abraham. Well, no, the Bible says it's by faith. It's not by baptism. It's not by child dedication. So that's not what child dedication is. Child dedication is not a means of placing the child within the membership of the church. When you have, and again, that's because some people, they, they think child dedication and infant baptism are the same thing. Infant baptism, and in, in <clears throat> Just think about this for a little bit. But those who believe in infant baptism, they say, some will say, infant baptism doesn't save. It doesn't give the child salvation, but it makes them a member of the church. Now you think about that for a little while. And uh, when you think about that, how can you be a member of the church if you're not, you don't even belong to the Lord? That doesn't even make sense. Acts 2.41 tells us about some people who... Uh, were made church members, and it says, and <clears throat> then they that received his word, uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what you find first is that they heard the message. You can't receive what you haven't heard, you know. So they, they heard the message, and then they received it, which simply means that they accepted it, that they believed it. Well, again, a child can't do either of those things. Uh, and so then they followed the Lord in believers' baptism. Then they became members of that church in Jerusalem, is what it's talking about there. So child dedication is not a means of placing the child into the membership of the church. Also, a child dedication is not a means of protecting an unsaved child. This, again, is what is taught with infant baptism. And as a result, those who don't believe in infant baptism, well, we need to dedicate our baby because if we don't our baby won't be safe well that's not the teaching of scripture at all because God's mercy is extended to all 
who have not yet come to the age of accountability, whether that means they're, you know, seven minutes old, seven years old, if they haven't come to the age of, of accountability, uh, they are under the protection of God. We don't dedicate them to the Lord by means of saying, okay, God, now, if something were to happen to my baby, now you're going to take them to heaven. And if I hadn't done this, then my baby's not going to go to heaven. That's not what child dedication is at all. Again, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 21 says this, uh, Then said the servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, uh, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me and that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And here, here's the interesting statement. He says, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. What is he saying? He's not just talking about death. Well, we're we're all going to die one day, and so we'll be we'll be together. But if you know if, if that's just talking about death, and some people see death, then what is that? That's nothing to look forward to. If there's nothing after life, you die, and that's the end of it. That's nothing positive. He's talking about the fact that this child, because it was innocent, because it had not reached that age of accountability, was with the Lord, and so that when his life was over, he also would be with the Lord with this child. That's what he's talking about. So when we're talking about child dedication, that is what it is not, all these things. And like I said, next week we'll talk about what it is because, like I said, I wanted to go over these things but not necessarily spend the whole, the whole time that we have uh, looking at this. Galatians chapter 1, and uh, we're going to begin today with uh, verse number 3. Galatians 1, verse 3, we'll read down through verse 9. If you would stand together uh, as we read our text, it says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some which trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have re, uh, preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said unto you, or as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the truth of it. We pray that as we spend time looking into your word, that you would speak to our hearts. Give us understanding. And uh, Lord, I pray that if there's one here who's lost, that you would convict their heart, their need to receive the gospel of Christ for their salvation. And uh, Lord, I just pray for your blessing and for your presence now at this time. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So today we're actually starting a new series that we'll be doing in the 2.30 service over the next uh, four to six weeks, depending on how it all works out. But uh, the title of the series is The Gospel and the Galatians. There are a lot of things about the gospel in the book of Galatians, uh, a lot of uh, subsidiary things that tie into the gospel that we need to understand. And... Uh, and, and we're going to look, <clears throat> we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the context uh, of uh, the historical context of the book of Galatians, why it was written. Because when we understand that, what Galatians is telling us makes a lot more sense. And uh, we can learn a lot more from it. Uh, but you know, there is a great misunderstanding today about what is the gospel of Christ and how that gospel is appropriated in our lives today. Much, of, in fact, most, the majority of what is called Christendom today uh, can be broken up into two categories. And the first category being those who claim that something must be added to faith in Christ in order to obtain salvation. 
The second category is those who claim that something must be added to faith in Christ in order to maintain salvation. That's two groups, uh, and, and uh, they're, not, mm, they're not exactly the same. You say, well, you're saying the same thing two different ways. No, I'm not. I'm saying two different things. Yeah. And, uh, and now, I will tell you, both of these options, or both of these categories, are wrong. They don't follow the Word of God at all. Uh, the Word of God actually contradicts both of these philosophies, both of these ideas. What, what does that mean then? What that means is that the majority of Christendom teaches something that is not true. And they call it the gospel. Yet it's not true. It will not bring salvation. And so it's an important thing. Now, uh, th th it, is, it is a great misunderstanding among people today. But it's nothing new. It didn't just spring up overnight, just last night or last week or last year. This misunderstanding has been going on since the days of the apostles. I want you to turn over to the book of Acts chapter 15. Because Acts chapter 15 really gives us the, uh, the context for the book of Galatians. Because it tells us what was going on when the book of Galatians was written. It tells us why the book of Galatians was written. In Acts chapter 15, and um, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 uh, to begin with. We'll read, we'll read several other verses uh, as we go through, but uh, verses 1 and 2 it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dis, uh, dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So there were those who were saying that the law had to be followed in order to receive salvation. That's what's being said. Because circumcision is part of the law. And so this is what's going on. And where did this come from? It came, it says, from Judea. But if we want to narrow it down, it came from some people who were part of the church at Jerusalem. Which is why that Barnabas and Paul were sent to Jerusalem. It wasn't that, well, Jerusalem's the mother church and we've got to find out what's going on. It's that people are coming from Jerusalem preaching this and we need to go find out what's going on. Why are they doing this? Why are, 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 is, is that what this church is preaching? They're trying to get to the bottom of it. And of course, when they got there, they found out that's not what they were preaching there at all. These people were going out saying, hey, I'm from the church of Jerusalem, and this is what we believe. But it wasn't what we believe. It's what they themselves thought. And they themselves were in error. But if you go down into verse 5, you find not only those who said you had to follow the law in order to obtain salvation, but there's also those who taught that you had to follow the law in order to maintain or to keep hold of their salvation. Verse 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So what are they saying? Well, we don't know if they're saved or not because they've got to keep the law. And if they don't keep the law... They might not be saved. They might lose their salvation. That's what is being taught here. So the idea that something is added to faith in Christ to receive salvation, and the idea that something is added to faith in Christ to maintain or to keep our salvation, both of those things, both of those false ideas were going on back in the days of the apostles. So again, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. Uh, but definitely uh, it was going on there. Again, uh, we, we mentioned that uh, they met there at the Church of Jerusalem because these people were coming from the Church of Jerusalem. So they're trying to find out, you know, what are you people doing? What are you sending out? Do you even know what you're sending out? Do you know what people are saying? And they say they're coming from you. And uh, so again here in verse 1, Acts 15, 1, and certain men which came down from Judea taught, taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Verse 4. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. 
And the, they declared all things that God had done with them. And then verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. We're going to talk about this. We're going to get to the bottom of this and find out what's really going on. And you know what, what happened? There were a bunch of arguing going on. It was, uh, it was not a very nice church business meeting. I've been in some of those where there's arguing and yelling and, and things like that. Fortunately, very rarely in the church I was a member of. Fortunately, it's, it's almost always been, you know, somebody else's church. And I walk on and say, boy, I'm glad I'm not a member here. And uh, so that, that's really good. But there was a lot of arguing going on. But then the Apostle Peter stands up and he talks about or he describes the appropriation of the gospel, how someone is saved. And he talks about that here in Acts 15 and verse number 7. He says this, And when there had been much disputing, see, there's a bunch of yelling back and forth. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, you're a loser. There was all that going on. There had been much disputing. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. You see, he pointed out, this is how they appropriated the gospel. This is how they were saved. It wasn't by keeping the law. It was by faith, just like we were saved by faith. There wasn't a different gospel for them. It's the same gospel for everybody, and it all has to do with faith. But then he also goes on and talks about the danger of converting the gospel, or perverting, if you want to use that term, uh, perverting the gospel into a message of works. The idea that, hey, you better live right, or you're not going to get saved. Or, you better live right, or you're not going to stay saved. Either one of those. He said, now, that's a perversion. That's twisting the gospel. That's turning the gospel on its head. That's not what the gospel is at all. Look at verses 10 and 11 here in Acts 15. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ shall we be saved, even as they. So what he's saying is, look, if, if we tell people, you've got to follow the law to get saved, or you have to follow the law to stay safe. We're tempting God. We're scrutinizing God. We're, we're really critiquing God. God, you really didn't know what you were saying when you gave the gospel. Really, you, you should have had this in it. And we know better than God how the gospel is supposed to work. That's what they're saying. They're tempting God. But he also says that, uh, that does nothing but bring people into bondage. It brings them into bondage to fulfill the law. And we'll talk a little more about that later. But it also denies the faith. It denies the fact that we are saved by God's grace through faith. It denies that. Because what it does is it, it attaches faith not on the grace of God, not on the finished work of Christ, but it attaches faith to the law. It attaches faith to my ability to keep the law both things. And neither one of those is correct. Because our faith is not to be in ourselves and our ability to keep the law. But our faith is to be in Christ. So that really is the underlying context of why the book of Galatians was written. Because all this was going on and these churches in, in the, uh, the province, the Roman province of Galatia, they had been taught and they had heard the gospel from Barnabas and Paul. And they had uh, been preached to. But then, after they had received the gospel, then these people from Jerusalem came in and said, No, 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 no. They didn't tell you the whole truth. The whole truth is now you have to keep the law. Or the whole truth is you had to keep the law in order to get it in the first place. And so there was a lot of confusion among the churches of Galatia. And so that is the reason that Paul writes this letter to the churches of Galatia. And so let's look at this, and what Paul does initially, he starts out right off the bat stating what is the gospel. Amen. Look here in verse number 3. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the gospel really is all about what Jesus has already done. It's, it's about what is past. Now, its effect is present as well as future, but it's done. And so it starts out at verse 4, who gave himself. And, and that's the thing about the gospel is that Christ gave himself. In John 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So he says he gave himself. He also says that he might deliver us. So not only is, is he the one who gave himself, but he is the deliverer. Romans 11, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And then it, it uh, finishes up according to the will of God and our Father. So he fulfilled all the will of God. Hebrews 10, 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And Jesus did fulfill the will of God. He fulfilled every jot and every tittle of the law. Every part of it. That's why we don't have to fulfill the law because Christ did it for us. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse number 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You and I cannot fulfill the law. We'll talk about that a little more uh, a little bit later on. We can't fulfill the law. It's, in, it's an impossibility. We already read where Peter said the Jews never could. So we never could. Why would we ask the Gentiles to do what we never could do? We can't do it. But Christ did. He fulfilled every aspect of the law. And he fulfilled it perfectly. And, uh, and he also fulfilled every aspect of God's will that was necessary to appropriate our salvation. He did everything. In John 18 and verse 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheep. The cup which the Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? What am I going to do? Say, Lord, I, I, you know, it's your will. I'm not doing it. No, that's not what he's going to do at all. And then in John chapter 19 and verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. He did it all. He fulfilled everything necessary to bring about our salvation. Now, the gospel not only centers around the finished work of Christ, but it also teaches us the power of Christ. Because looking again here in verse 4, not only does it say he gave himself, himself it says he gave himself for our sins. So he didn't give himself for no reason at all. There was a purpose why he gave himself. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And uh, the sacrifice of himself, that he gave himself, for our sins. And him giving himself for your sin and for mine. That's enough. That is enough. There, you don't need to do anything on top of what Jesus did. To make yourself acceptable to God. Or to keep yourself acceptable to God as far as eternal salvation is concerned. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you need to do. In Matthew chapter 27 verses 15 uh, 15 and 51 says, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent train, uh, twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. You see, the, the fact that the veil was rent from top to bottom, God was saying, there's no more need of sacrifice. There's no more need for following the law to be right with God. Amen. Christ did it all. Christ finished everything. His sacrifice of himself is all that's needed to take away your sin and mine. That's it. And so it, it, the, the gospel, it talks about what Christ has already done, but it talks about his power, that his sacrifice was enough. 
that he's a deliverer, he says here in verse 4, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. He's a deliverer from the present. Ephesians 2 and verse 2, where in time past he walked according to the courts of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We're delivered from the presence because, because our citizenship has changed. No longer are we citizens of this world. No longer are we children of the devil. Now we are citizens of heaven. Now we are the children of God. In uh, John 15, verses 18 and 19, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. There is a different citizenship there. So we're still in the world. We live in the world. But we don't have to participate in the evil participated in or perpetrated by this world. We don't have to. We are delivered from this present evil world. We don't have to be part of what's going on. We don't have to. In John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. So Christ then empowers us to overcome this present evil world. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So when we're talking about the gospel, Paul starts out with what the gospel is. It's all about what Christ has already done. And it's all about the power of Christ to accomplish what's needed in your life and in mine because of what he's already done. Rather than Jesus started, sort of like I was, I did a thing years ago and, and I looked at all the different denominations that were in our town, in the city that uh, we were living in, and uh, I went through what they believe uh, as far as salvation is concerned. And uh, it was disturbing uh, when, when I had finished. But anyway, I'll, I'll never forget one of those groups, and I don't even remember which group it was, so I'm not even going to, you know, I'm not even going to try to put a name out there. But uh, what they said is that what Jesus did on the cross puts us on the way of salvation. In other words, it sets us on the right path. But then we have to live the right kind of life. And if we don't live the right kind of life, then we're not going to make it to heaven in the end. That's not what the gospel is. No. The gospel is what Jesus already did. And the gospel is the power of Christ to make us what we've never been. The children of God and citizens of heaven. That's what the gospel is. And that's what Paul's talking about here. But let's go on in verses 6 and 7. And we see the gospel superseded. It's not that there's anything that can overcome the gospel. And that's better than the gospel. But there's some things that people will allow to overtake the gospel. I'm talking about individual people. As well as religious groups. Verses 6 and 7, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So what, what is he saying? There is another gospel. There is. Everything that's preached is not the truth. That's what he's saying. It's not all the truth. And so now, uh, Paul's referring back to what we read in Acts 15. He's referring back to those people that were going around. They, they left the city of Jerusalem, and they're going around confusing people with, with their preaching, saying that the law has to be kept, and, and so on and so forth. And, and certainly, this would apply with many different ideas concerning salvation today. It's not the gospel it's another gospel. And it's not even that, because that's what he said, verse 7, which is not another. It's not. It's not the gospel. And, and what he's saying by that is it's not from God. It, it's not God's message. It's not what God wants us to know about Christ. It's not what God wants us to know about salvation. This is just a fake gospel. That's what it is. It's a fake. It's, not, it's counterfeit. Now, how many of you have ever seen counterfeit money? Okay, a couple of you have seen that. I've seen some that I, I could have sworn was counterfeit. 
I, I worked in the bank in the in the U.S. I was a bank teller in the U.S. when they came out with the new hundreds. Of course, they've come out with about five different generations of that since. Uh, but when those first came out, they were so very different because if if you've ever seen U.S. funds from back in the day, the face, the portrait, was in the center, and it was fairly small. But then this was a huge face that filled top to bottom, and it was off-center. And so, of course, they would give us all these on the day that, uh, you know, the retirees came to cash their Social Security checks. And so here I am trying to give them these new bills. Now, I don't want that. That's counterfeit. <laughs> Do you think as a bank I'm going to give you something that looks totally different from what you're used to and expect you to take that? Uh, and they, they wouldn't, no, no, we'll not have it. But, you know, it, it was funny. Before I went to lunch that day, uh, well, to back up, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, which prints all, all the money and so on, uh, that's a central bank there in the U.S., they, uh, they said that the reason they're printing these new bills is to prevent counterfeiting. And I tell you, those were the plainest, boringest looking bills I've ever seen. And I thought, this is going to be so easy to counterfeit because there's far less detail than what we had. So that day that they brought out the new hundreds, before lunch, I got word that already someone not an hour's drive from our bank had passed off counterfeit hundreds of the new ones that couldn't be counterfeited. <laughs> good job. Yeah, good job. So anyway, that's why they've come out with all these different generations since then. And oh, well, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> it is what it is. Uh, but the thing is, those are fake. Uh, those <laughs> and while someone, some people may accept those, when you get to the bank and you try and pass off a counterfeit 100 or 50 or 20, whatever, that's just not going to fly. You know, you bring in counterfeit hundreds and like to break this for 20s. It's just not going to fly. It's not going to work. And it's the same thing with the counterfeit gospel. You can carry that around and you can show people and you can fool people into thinking that's the genuine article. But when you take that to God and say, look, here's my gospel that I've received. And, and because or on the basis that I've received this gospel... I need to go to heaven. God's going to say, I don't think so. That's a counterfeit. It's not going to be acceptable. And that's what he's talking about here. It's a fake. It has no power to bring salvation. It has no power to maintain salvation. It also brings trouble. He says, uh, again in verse 7, uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. That is, to stir, agitate. There are some people, all they're doing is causing you problems. All they're doing is bringing in confusion to you. And really, do you? that's why there's so many denominations. Because the devil wants to make sure people are confused as to what the gospel really is. That's why. And so that they'll believe in a counterfeit. Or that they'll just throw up their hands and say they're all a bunch of fakes. That's what the devil wants. That's why there's so many different denominations, so many different churches out there. It's not all because, well, it's just their way of worshiping God. No. <laughs> it's because they are trying to promote a counterfeit. And they're confusing people. They're troubling people. And uh, it, it's, again, another tool that the, the, the devil uses. And then he ends up, they're, they're, which are not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's a perversion of the gospel. How many differences does there need to be to make a gospel message a perversion? How many differences? One. one. That's exactly right. Just one. Doesn't Well, you know, it's close. Look, you can pass off a counterfeit that's really, really close. That doesn't make it the genuine article. Unless it's the genuine article. It's got to be the real thing to be the real thing. Some of you are thinking Coca-Cola right now. <laughs> <laughs> some of you, some of you younger ones, what is he talking about? 
<laughs> Don't worry about it. You I'm missed out on life. That's all I can tell you. So, there's a perversion of the gospel. You see, if salvation is not initially granted to the sinner through the sacrifice of Christ alone, that's a perversion. Salvation cannot be received by any other avenue. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. If salvation is not forever maintained through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ alone, that is a perversion of the gospel. Salvation cannot be maintained by any other avenue than by what Christ has already done. Look over in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. This verse says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Why? Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you, you see what that's saying? Because of the completed gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's why we can be sure that when we trust Christ alone, we're saved forever. Amen. It's not based on how good I am or how good you are or what church we're baptized in. That, that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what Christ has already done and trusting him alone and forgetting about all the rest. That's where salvation comes. Anything else is a perversion. Look at verses 8 and 9. And here we see the gospel shielded. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have uh, preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You know, don't kids hate that? When their parents tell them to do something twice. I heard you the first time. You haven't done it yet. <laughs> I've seen this played out. I'm not saying it was my children. <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't. But I'm not saying it was. But I've seen this played out uh, in, in, you know, throughout my life. Uh, in, in kitchen. I, already, I heard you the first time. You don't have to tell me over and over. Really? <laughs> Why haven't you done it? Well, I was going to win. Well, I was getting ready to... No, you weren't. <laughs> no, you weren't. You're laying there in bed with your head covered. You weren't about to do anything. So anyway, really that, that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, he's saying it twice, not, not because he had extra ink. And he was looking to use that little bit of extra ink uh, to say something. And, and it's not because... Uh, he was senile. You know how some people do when they get older. <clears throat> they repeat themselves again and again and again. And especially, and, and, and I, I'm not saying this humorously, but uh, those who have uh, dementia or Alzheimer's or different things like that, and they begin to repeat themselves. My uncle did that. Uh, and and uh, it was sad uh, the last time that my dad saw him. Uh, he said, you know, they were there maybe an hour. And he said in the course of that time, he told the same story five, six times. And he didn't remember, you know. That's sad. And, and obviously we're not talking about that. That's not what's going on with Paul. He's saying it twice because it is so important. And here, okay, let's, let's talk about this. He's using strong language. But he said, we've got to watch out for the sources you know what he says there in verse 8? But the we, he puts himself there. But more than just himself, he's putting uh, those that were with him, those who traveled with him. He put them in this boat as well. Uh, he says, we, go back to verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither of man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So it's not just me, but it's all of us who are together and we're writing this letter to you if we come and we tell you something different than what you've already heard. Let us be accursed. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So he's saying it doesn't matter what some preacher says. 
if it doesn't line up with the message of salvation that God tells us about in his word, we're not supposed to listen to it. That's just how it is. Oh, but they're a man of God. If they're telling us something that doesn't line up with scripture, they can claim any title they want to. It doesn't make them so. And we should not listen to that. Oh, but, you know, I grew up hearing this. It doesn't matter. That's really immaterial. Because if you, if you grew up being told a lie, you need to know the difference. You need to learn better before it is eternally too late. So we can't, we have to consider the source. He says, again here in the verse 8, but the weak or an angel from heaven. Oh, but they had a vision. They've had all these visions and God told them that if we would just do these things that we would be saved. Don't fall for that. If it's not written in the word of God, it's not true. Amen. And yes, there are people who claim all sorts of things that they've had visions about. Uh, I've got some quotes here. I'm just not going to take the time to read them. But there are just all sorts of things. But here's, here's what Paul ends up with over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In talking about these people who have these dreams, these preachers, these angels, these visions, these dreams. Here's how Paul kind of ties all that together. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So we, we have to be careful of the source. Are we getting our source, as far as the gospel is concerned, from the word of God? Or are we getting it from just some book somewhere? I had a guy when... <clears throat> When uh, we were missionaries in Papua New Guinea, uh, we, we lived in town for a short time. And uh, our next door neighbor, he was religious. And he and I, we talked about the gospel. We talked about salvation. And it was sad because he knew all the terminology. And he thought that he knew what the gospel was. But he came to me one time. And uh, he came to me and he brought me this book. And uh, uh, he said, uh, here, look at this book. You know, this tells everything about what we believe. And I go over this all the time, and, and it just reminds me about our faith and how wonderful it is. It's like, look, you don't need this book, but you need the Bible. Amen. And, and sadly, he, he, never, he never got that. He never got that point. Uh, he, his, he kept going back to that book instead of, let's stick with God's Word, Amen. instead of what some man has written. But look at the sentence again in verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, the word accursed, that means to be banned or excommunicated. Paul here is not saying, if anybody comes to you and preaches any other gospel, let him die and go to hell. That is not what Paul is saying here. What he's saying is, don't let him in your pulpit. That's what he's saying. He's saying don't listen to him. If he comes and preaches any other gospel, don't listen to him. I hear all the time uh, people tell me, oh, I love listening to this preacher on the radio or this preacher on TV. I love listening to them. And the sad thing is, a lot of times, I know who those people are. And I know they don't preach the gospel. And I know that those people telling me that don't know any better. They should, but they don't. And so they listen to them and they think, boy, they're great. And they get sucked in with things that are not true because they're not counting them to be accursed. So, no, I'm not going to listen to anything they have to say because, they look, if they're not right on the gospel, what else are they going to be wrong on? Well, I understand that, you know, as far as the gospel, I understand we're a little bit different, but they're really good on this. Are you so sure? Counterfeit's still a counterfeit. Oh, but it's really good carving. Really great engraving on that counterfeit. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? 
But they did a really good job with their counterfeit. And so I really like looking at it. No, that's dumb is what that is. So we ought to be smarter than that. So what Paul is saying is he's telling the Galatians to cut all ties with anybody who would influence them into believing anything contrary to the truth of the gospel of Christ. That's what he's saying. Don't listen to them. Don't let them in your pulpit. You know, that's one reason why, Lord willing, there will never be anyone stand in this pulpit and preach something to this church that is contrary to the gospel of Christ. And there will never be anyone stand in this pulpit and preach anything who that individual preacher does not believe what the word of God teaches concerning the gospel of Christ. You know, I know that there are churches where they trade pulpits with other denominations and so on. We won't. I'm just telling you right now, we won't. It will not happen. Why? Because they're to be accursed. They're to be banned. We're not supposed to allow that. So, uh, and, and, and here's, here's the thing. If the false teachers do not change what they preach, if they do not change what they believe, they will be condemned to hell. They will. Because they're, oh, but they're a man of God. But they're not preaching and teaching the gospel. They're preaching and teaching a counterfeit. And a counterfeit won't get you anywhere. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Paul said, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind early things. Their end is destruction. Why? But wait a minute. They're preachers. They're men of God. But they don't believe the gospel. They believe something else. And that's what it takes to be saved. Not to be a preacher. Being a preacher doesn't give you a leg up on getting into heaven. I'll tell you that. <laughs> that's not how it works. There are not many gospels. There are many counterfeits. But there are not many gospels. There are not many ways into heaven. There's only one way. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ himself and what he's already done through his death burial and resurrection whenever anybody teaches or preaches that salvation is obtained or maintained through anything other than the completed work of Christ they are presenting another gospel and we need to turn them off and not say well I, you know I'll listen to them about this but not no no we need to turn them off period just avoid it altogether we ought never to allow the influence of a spirit or an individual to turn us away from the Word of God. And we need to rejoice that God has given us the gospel message. And we ought to share it. Because there are all kinds of people right here in town. They would call themselves Christians, but they haven't believed the gospel. They don't know the gospel. We have the gospel. We know the gospel. So it is our responsibility to share that gospel with them. That, look, you can do all that stuff all you want. It's not going to happen. You simply need to trust Christ. Trust what he has already done. Just like the songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. There's nothing else for us to add to what he's done. And look. If we think there's something we can do, like, uh, you know, we get saved by trusting what Christ did, but then we live a good life, how little does that individual think of Jesus? How little when he thinks that his living can complement and complete what Christ did? How sad. Because Jesus did pay it all. Amen. We simply need to trust him. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.